Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Right, so the meeting here is to answer the question, why should a British nationalist support the British Democrats, given that there's a plethora of organisations out there all appealing for your support? So how would we define the British Democrats as opposed to other nationalist organisations? Well, we're a nationalist policy that pursues reasonable arguments, which are supported by the majority of the British people, though you couldn't tell that from the mainstream media. And we follow in the wake of successful electoral strategy parties in the past. The National Front was very successful until it fell apart through internal dissension. It was not defeated by the establishment. It defeated itself. We have to learn from the lessons. The British National Party again had policies which were remarkably popular. A blind test was done by one of the many establishment polling organisations, which showed that more than 50% of people supported the policies of the BNP when they were simply presented as policies. They simply said, do you agree with these policies? Most people did. When they were told there were BNP policies, after all the smearing that had gone on in the, in the press and the media, they said, oh, uh, mm, well, uh, perhaps not the more extreme ones. And when they were told that the leader of the party was a certain Nick Griffin, they became positively hostile. So the message there is that establishment smearing can work in that it can dissuade people from telling, telling organisations what they really think if enough effort is put into smearing the name of the party and uh, if finding if there's any criminal tendencies among the, the leadership. Now, we start from a clean slate. The establishment has got nothing on us, and we hope to keep it that way because we want to avoid the excesses of thuggery, which are the cheap uh, way of smearing any nationalist party. We don't want to go down the road of the Tommy Robinsons or the Paul Goldings, who was arrested last night in Wakefield, I believe. There are suspicions that this is all an attempt to bring in donations by being in the media all the time, attracting attention. We don't care whether we attract attention or not, except for very good reasons. We don't want to attract attention by being n notorious. It's doing the establishment's job for it. So one of the things that distinguishes the Paul Goldings and the Tommy Robinsons is it's hard to discern what is their objective. Do they actually have a goal or are they simply in the business of being in that business to generate their uh, actual income? Is all Tommy Robinson or Paul Golding does geared towards drawing money in for their own support? Most of us would suspect the latter. We actually want to achieve something. Now, our maximal objective, obviously, is to restore Britain to being a nation state. That is to say, a state founded round a people. The modern tendency is to say that if you're made a citizen of Britain, you're British. We say no. You're British, therefore you're a citizen, not the other way around. You can't retrospectively make people British. <laughs> retrospectively make people British, but because they are citizens. That is going back to the French Revolution. It was the French Revolution that introduced the idea that states had to be built around citoyens. And the reason was very simple. France was a multiplicity of ethnicities, Basques, Bretons, Catalans. They had to find some glue to hold that together, and they came up with citizenship. We were in the fortunate position during the Napoleonic Wars of not being in that position. And if we'd had any sense, we'd have kept that on after 1948. We would not have allowed the nation state to be systematically eroded by the arrival of immigrants, which means we're no longer a nation and a very uh, a state with a somewhat ambiguous future. So we're following in the wake of the National Front and the British National Party. Our policies will be reasonable, supported by the majority, but even to make this a nation state again means certain minimum criteria have to be met. First, as Mike said, we have to maintain the union. That is fundamental to the idea of Britishness, is that we're English, Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish, united. Any party which seeks to uh, destroy the Union is our enemy. We want to maintain our external borders. That means strong defences and it also means control of immigration, when immigration is the source of potential conflict, because you are bringing in people from the other side of the world, 
It's not about race. It's not about the colour of the skins, actually. It's about culture. What they won't admit is that the principal conflicts between races are actually due to the fact they have cultural differences. Take a West Indian on the one hand and a Pakistani on the other. Their views on family and marriage are diametrically opposed. One will support marriage until death. The other will support freewheeling males wandering around the globe, uh, having, uh, having children by different mothers who are then forced to bring them up as single mums, etc. The two are incompatible. In the long run, it will become obvious that, that the one and the other cannot form a rainbow coalition. So we want to restore the idea of Britain as a nation state. Going back to the French Revolution, there are three slogans in the French Revolution. Liberty, equality and fraternity. Now, both Tories and Liberals, which is why they allied so easily into each other in places uh, uh, not a million miles from here, both Liberals and Tories support freedom, first and foremost. The Tories see it in terms of economic freedom, the right of, if you like, anything up to untrammeled global capitalism, where corporations should be free to do as much as they want uh, with no controls on them. The Liberals see it more in terms of personal freedom. I must be allowed to do whatever I want with minimal controls upon me. You can see there are certain tensions between the two, but we've all had examples of wishy-washy Tories who grade into Liberals and wishy-washy Liberals who can still have a strong Thatcherite edge when it comes to the economy. But they think principally about the idea of freedom, liberty, not having controls, not having a nanny state. At the other extreme, you have those who worship freedom. Now, freedom is not a national... Uh, those who worship... Sorry. Those who worship equality, the socialists. Equality is not a natural state in nature. No. In nature, things differentiate. There are big fish that eat little fish. There are people that rise to the top. There are people who do not make any effort to rise at all. There are people who will always sponge and never work, etc. Equality, therefore, has to be imposed rather than create itself. So you need a straight which redistributes wealth, which leans on people who seem to be doing too well and tries to jack up the incomes of those who are not doing so well. The, 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 both of those are ultimately dependent on what we are about, which is fraternity. We figure that if you're dealing with people who are kin of each other, that they will make more effort to look after each other, they will not necessarily... Uh, treat people uh, as inferiors because they earn less or because they're seen as a lower category of person, but only in a society which is ultimately a brotherhood of kinfolk are you likely to get the self-sacrifice, the altruism, the laying down of your life on July the 1st, 1916, etc. Sorry, 1970. Uh, the, the, the laying down of lives that we celebrate in our past, and we, we have good reason to, because people were prepared to make sacrifices for the nation. That goes right the way down to the early nationalised industries. The NHS when it started, British Rail when it started, they were an attempt by people to make sacrifices for the common good, even if it involved taking less home themselves, which we should think about when we think about the RMT strike at the moment, how very different they are from some trade unionists in the past, who would not have inflicted this suffering on ordinary people in order to maximise their wage packets when they're paid so much already. So our, our understanding is that only in a society that is one common ethnic group will this sort of solidarity, this sort of um, uh, self-sufficiency be possible. We look to the Ukraine, or to Ukraine I should say, and we see this in action. If Ukraine was a, 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 a congerie uh, of, of different ethnic groups, would it be fighting as hard against the Russian invasion? The answer is obviously no. It's only when people re are related to each other by blood and by language that they're going to make that effort. So we know where we stand. We want a nation state consisting of related people. That makes us, in terms of the media, racist. But we will examine that later on. If not in this talk, then I want to put a series of articles out on the website pointing out that the racism that we're accused of being is a purely defensive racism. We want to keep our country for ourselves. The racism that is being used to smear us... 
The racism that being to, used to smear us is the racism of the 19th century and early 20th century, which was aggressive and said, because I'm a superior race, I'm entitled to conquer you and reduce you to slaves, and uh, I can take as much of Europe or whatever as I want, or as much of Africa as I want, because I'm superior. But that is not the racism which we are putting forward. Ours is purely defensive. We don't want to be replaced or displaced in our own country. <laughs> to, to merge the two... To merge the two is a rhetorical trick, and we have to counter it. We also know that when people accuse us of being racist, what they're doing is smuggling in connotations through denotations. What I mean by that is there is, a, there is an honest and reasonable definition of racism. Uh, it's been adapted by the French Academy for the, for the latest Dictionary Francais, which is that a racist is somebody who believes that a country should be ethnically homogenous. That's a, a reasonable, straightforward statement which nobody in this room would disagree with and doesn't have any, con any connotations of thuggery, hatred, fear, Islamophobia, any of the phobias that you can imagine. It is a straightforward, reasonable statement that we think that history proves that empires collapse because they're multi-ethnic, but kingdoms which are homogenous will survive. If you look back at the 19th century and the early 20th century, that's what happened. The empires disintegrated under the shock of war. Britain did not because it was reasonably homogenous. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Tsarist Empire collapsed. They could not withstand the shock of war. So we don't ever want our descendants to be in that position. Now, you could say, OK, we're following the wake of the BNP and the NF. Why did they fail? In the NF case, internal dissension. In the BNP case, authoritarianism from the top. Any intelligent branch organiser was regarded as a threat, a liability, not an asset, because he threatened the throne. So he had to be got rid of. There's a whole succession of decent, intelligent, honourable people who were sacked because they got too big for their boots in the eyes of the leader. Local autonomy was not allowed. Everything was dictated from the top. Financial shenanigans, nobody knew what the accounts were doing because they were not transparent. And finally, as I say, the judiciary was corrupt because people could be sacked for, uh, for entirely um, arbitrary reasons. So what have we done about it? Well, we've produced, or rather Andrew Bruns has produced, a constitution which lays down that there is a separation of powers, the judiciary is not under the control of the executive, the Treasury is not under the control of the executive. All posts are elected. So there should never be a repeat of the dictatorial uh, basis of the BNP. So to, to pass on, uh, if the Constitution is right, then we shouldn't have any internal problems, but equally we shouldn't have the blind guidance from the top that disfigured the BNP. What are the prospects for unity? with other nationalist movements. Well, some reject electoral politics altogether and say all we can do is wage some sort of a cultural war. That's because their objective is no longer that of restoring Britain to a nation state. They're more or less admitting defeat in, in advance. They're speaking in terms of us surviving as a minority and they're already looking to make safe spaces, little white homelands in hills and, in hills and valleys far from big cities, where the white race can cling on rather like in Indian reservations. Well, that's writing off the game before it starts. If you go back to what I said earlier about the BNP, the policies being more popular than the brand, which was more popular than the leader, as long as we've got good leadership and we have a brand which isn't solid by associations with thuggery, then the policies are not a problem. Our policies will be popular. Uh, but to, to merge with other organisations at the moment, you run the risk that when you merge, you bring in dissonant voices from the start. The NF was, after all, a coalition of different previous organisations. Merger, I think, at the moment, merger in terms of we shake hands and agree to form a united front, would be premature because there will be... Basically, all you're doing is bringing the dissensions under one wing, but they don't go away. 
So all that will happen is in future there will be faction fighting and it will fall apart without the state having to do anything. I didn't mention it, but there's no reason to believe the NF's or the BNP's downfall was caused by state agents. They destroyed themselves because their constitutions either permitted or encouraged internal warfare. So, a merger at the moment is probably out of the question. But that's not to say that unification in the future isn't possible if we do well enough to impress people to join us. In other words, we would encourage recruitment from other parties and other organisations, probably not from the leadership, because the leadership will act defensively and say they're trying to steal my followers. Well, they're not your followers. They're British nationalists who can go wherever they choose and they will pursue success. If they see a party winning... If they see a party winning, they will naturally gravitate to it. And that is surely the long-term strategy. If we do well enough, think BNP Isle of Dogs, we need one breakthrough, and the rest follows through a snowball effect. People will say, this party seems to be breaking ahead of the rest, therefore I will join it. And that's all we should aim for, for the moment, is just doing better than the rest. But if we've got our act together, that will follow. We're getting high-quality recruits. We're not necessarily getting vast numbers at present, but we're getting high-quality recruits, organisers, people who can organise branches and draw in the recruits. So that is the way forward. Now, what are the new points in our favour? Well, first of all, GB News. I, I would urge everybody to watch GB News from morning till night because it's airing the views that we uh, have ourselves. They encourage people to write in with emails and say what they think. Unlike the mainstream media, they will not edit out, censor, suppress, cancel your views if you write in. If you don't write in, well, they don't get the message. But they, people like Patrick Christie's and Mark Stein and the rest of them, they will pay attention to our emails if we send them in. So send in the emails. The second is a major work which has been published by Douglas Murray, War on the West. Now, he takes the attack to the enemy. For years, we've been defensive. We've been saying, we're not racist, really. We've been cowering in the, in the darkness and saying, please don't accuse us of being nasty thugs. Douglas Murray goes on the offensive and reveals that the people who are attacking us are cowards, traitors, hypocrites, general scumbags who hate, who hate the West who hate the West and white people with a vengeance. To give you an example of the ridiculous lengths they go to, on page 198 you'll find evidence that two and two need not add up to make four in modern Californian primary schools because the experience of black people might lead them to want it to be five. I am not making that up. We've got professors of education arguing that mathematics follows white rationalist thinking. And therefore, when the white race is abolished, can't come too soon for the Marxist left, when the white race is abolished, mathematics and physics and all that white thinking will go to it. All those dead white males from Aristotle, Plato onwards, all their thinking will be abolished because it's tainted by their whiteness. It can't be allowed to be taught in schools, and that is something. That's why the statues are coming down on institution after institution. Places are being renamed. But one person is above suspicion above uh, accusations. That's Karl Marx. He used some singularly indelicate uh, uh, terms in his letters to um, Engels, including the N-word and the J-word and the rest of it in disparaging context, but he is above criticism. Why? Because this is the Marxist left, the cultural left. Wokeness, political correctness, is a Marxist attack on everything the West has stood for for the last 2,000 or more years. So, are there any new policies we want to introduce? Well, the first policy we want to introduce is to go onto the offensive, not to take it lying down anymore, but to take the war to the enemy and say, look who's talking, you are hypocrites, your sole argument is that everything white is wrong and everything black or brown is right, so who are the racists? You are anti-white racists. Everything you say against us is motivated by a hatred of us and, indeed, yourselves. You are motivated by self-hatred and self-disgust. See a psychiatrist. 
We don't want to hear your views because they are corrupt and tainted. You are the problem, not us. We are normal people. That's why the word racism wasn't used before uh, uh, Leon Trotsky propaga propagated it. And he said, with this weapon I will destroy the West. It's rather like in hoc signo vinces when Constantine saw the cross or whatever. But the point is that racism has been used by Marxist for one effort and one effort only to destroy the West. Jacques Derrida, the great French uh, structuralist, said, my aim is to destroy the West through the symbols and the language I use. I am going to erode it from the inside. So we have to fight against that, but we don't fight by being defensive, curling up into a ball like a hedgehog and hoping that it'll go away. We have to fight them on their own ground. Now, the only context in which we can do that are things like GB News, because it will let us speak. Other organisations won't. And failing that, we take the war to people with our leaflets and by standing as candidates. So, the aim is to reinforce the success we've had in the recent elections. And that's why, although historically we're based in Bradford and Leicester, we're going to move the centre of gravity down here to Essex and Kent and South East London, because... Our logic is to reinforce success, not try to compensate for failure. The way ahead is to invest all our resources in winnable seats, in a winnable area, if only because the left will not see it coming. They are used to tackling us on the same ground every year, knowing that we will stand there. So we will be outflanking them. The second thing is, in, if, just as a concluding note, one, uh, one advantage of not having premature union with other organisations is it makes it easier for the opposition to shut us down. If we were one big organisation, a single stroke of the pen could wipe us all out. Ban, ban the BDP would simply be required to eliminate all nationalism in Britain. As long as somebody is working towards a common goal, we should encourage working with them collaboratively and without trying to uh, merge with them prematurely. But as long as we do a good job, we feel that they will eventually want to join us out of their own free will because they, they appreciate success and they want to contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you.